Star Wars deck building in 30 minutes. So we're gonna review it quick. You are the rebel scum or those government mouth breathing Imperials trying to destroy each other through deck building by five cards every turn. Huh, that sounds like a lot of deck builders. It also has some card game elements like attacking each other with two different asymmetric factions. And then you can even attack the place where you buy cards. Oh yeah, it's two players only if you just buy one box. That's the only thing we'll cover after our five plays. This video is brought to you by Token Vessels, which I've been using for the last two months. Squishy component holders, because organization while gaming is cool. Made out of silicon, these are two nice sizes to fit all sorts of pieces. Wooden pieces, plastic pieces, cardboard chits. Heck, you can even use it to pick up and roll dice in your hand without even touching said dice. Token Vessels close up with a sturdy metal clasp, and look at that. The pieces aren't going anywhere. Hey, I can use this to store pieces for TI4. Once finished, into the box it goes. Ooh, that's token vessels. Check out the link in the description to get some at 15% off. They come in a bunch of different sizes and colors and discounts if you buy in bulk. Now, back to the video. How to play. Goal is to kill your enemy base three times, then you win. To do that, you'll be building up a deck, then getting units with attacking power to attack your opponent. Every turn, you'll use five cards to buy as many as you want. This symbol is like money. You buy your color or the gray ones. Things you buy will go into your discard, which means it's part of your deck later on. Some cards will have an ability to just use once when played. You can also attack your opponent with units with guns. Oh, you can also attack things in the middle that belong to your opponent's faction. If you kill the HP all at once, you get a reward. And if your turn, you discard everything, then draw five cards again from deck. There's also these big capital ships that don't actually discard after play. They stay there and give stuff every turn. Plus, they're like shields. If you're attacked, these capital ships take damage first. The moment your base dies, not to fret, you just pick another one. When your third base dies, then you lose the game. Last thing, there's a force tracker to see who has more midichlorians by playing cards with this symbol on it to move it one step closer towards you. If it's anywhere on your side, you have the force on your side. Woohoo! If it's at the end, you get plus one resource at start of turn. If it's in the middle, no one has force on their side. Essentially, draw five cards, play all of them. Buy stuff, kill stuff in the middle, use card abilities, attack your opponent, then discard everything. That's the end of your turn. Rinse and repeat till three bases are dead. Pros! It's filled with art. There's so many unique cards with gorgeous art. I mean, thank you FFG for having so many different games to take this art from because the sheer diversity is freaking awesome. There's also the blue borders for Imperials and red for Rebels to keep things distinct. Iconography is also very clear. Attacking something, using the force, and getting resources are dead obvious. Flavor text on many cards, very cool. Oh, it's easy to see the central market because you orient the factions to their players and the reward is upside down with another number. Simple design, but really appreciated. And it's super easy to just start playing. The rule book is very clear with the frequently asked question area. FFG is learning to make better rule books. Player aids, also good. For the game itself, all you have to do is take out your labeled starter cards, set up this force tracker, and flop down the main buy market. Then you're ready to play. Now for the gameplay pros, the idea to Attack the central things and collect a bounty is well done. First, you're getting more options to attack in a deck builder because it's not like players have standing units with the clearing at the end of every turn. So instead of going full send towards opponent HP, now you have options. Plus, it allows for the thematic inclusion of bounty hunters who are good at killing the market or giving you their own rewards. Then, since bounties can scale huge, you can kind of do a racing game against your opponent. Will I buy the card before he can kill it? Maybe I'll voluntarily discard it through another ability to deny him. That gets us into the cool balance this game has between three main things. One, building the deck building engine to get more cards and resources. Two, doing damage. And three, the push and pull of the force. Let's get into all of these. So look at all these ways to draw more cards or exile cards to remove them from your deck or find synergies between archetypes. Plus you can strive towards getting capital ships which are a feel good shield around your base. But the only way to win is damage. So do you want to just get big numbers to smack your opponent or get more guys to attack your opponent's middle row for more resources sometimes and sometimes getting the force? Oh yeah, balancing the force. So you can get that resource every turn, but also just having the force on your side helps with so many strong card abilities and denying your opponent the force can be worth the effort. There's the awesome asymmetry between the rebels and the Imperials. While each side has the same exact starting deck and many cards that mirror each other in the game, the way they differ, okay, let's put it in Magic the Gathering terms. So the Empire is playing a control deck and the rebels are playing a aggro deck. The rebels are scrappy with hard hitting heroes and big fighters. Holy cow, that B-wing is epic. And they want to sabotage through discarding cards from the empire's hand. They're also a little bit more maneuverable because bountying empire units in the middle 
can't let them exile their deck pretty often. And they start out with the force because duh, they're the good guys. The Tax Collector Empire are about their hulking capital ships and a bigger combo-ing bureaucratic nature. Star Destroyers and Imperial Carriers are the gift that just keeps giving. And TIE Fighters let you start plussing like crazy if those capital ships stay alive. To buy time, the Empire is playing market control with ATSTs and the Book of Boba Fett to wipe out rebel heroes before they can enter play. Now we can get to the thematic interactions between all these cards. Princess Leia can grab any rebel card in the middle for free. Oh, let's grab her brother. The Millennium Falcon can bring back Han Solo to draw two cards, which can go get Chewie, who lets you draw another card. The Empire can Grand Moff Tarkin to add any Empire card directly into your hand which does die at end of round, so you just get super cheap TIE Bombers to delete those speeders, and then I don't need that TIE Bomber anymore after that. Disposable. For neutral cards, there's frigates to repair your base, or Jawa Scavengers to buy from the market discard. Oh, how about using Jabba the Butt's Barge to grab Bounty Hunters from your discard? There's also Brisk, Satisfying Progression. The attacking mechanic of the center row lets you have big turns by killing something in the middle that gives me plus four resources. Wow, so now I have seven resources turn one. And what do you know? You have as many buys as you want to set up really quickly. And since your capital ships can give you income every turn, after you invest it in them, if you keep them alive, you're getting a good turn every turn. And there's even a change up in pacing with the different bases. Since after your first vanilla one dies, you get to choose from up to 10 as your replacement. There's a ton of different abilities, like giving yourself a new passive or a sudden spike of a card buy. You can really pick one according to your current deck's progress and how likely your opponent is to kill you right now, which is all thematic. Like look at this Hoth one that gives you armor every turn. This all starts to wrap up for some good replayability. There's dozens, and I mean dozens of unique cards in the central deck where the starting market five will probably be different every game. You can play with different deck building strategies and you can lengthen or shorter your game by requiring more or less bases to win. The final pro is that this game is just really thematic throughout. There's the designs of the factions to individual cards to the bases. These all speak to something in Star Wars from episodes four to nine, including Rogue One. Like, okay, I'm not gonna go through every single card, but let's uh, talk about a scenario I cooked up. The Empire is using Director Krennic to draw two cards because he's commanding from the Death Star. And the Death Star blows up a Mon Calamari cruiser. Uh, oh man, uh, send in the X-Wing and B-Wings. Then get the Force more to our side before Darth Vader can use it for plus four damage. He'll be attacking for 10, oh gosh. Cons. Gameplay cons. So Star Wars deck building doesn't really handle randomness the best way, even for a deck builder. First, the game is short and swingy, so you can't really recover from your opponent having a great turn early. Great buys early, game going into a very small deck of only 10 cards means you're gonna have great hands early game. You can just keep spamming those high value cards to snowball you. Like buying Princess Leia first turn, which gets you a high value card for free, it's kind of game over. A neutral version is Jabba the Butt, where if you get him really early, he gives you literally everything good, plus a way to exile to clean up your deck while replacing that card. This goes exactly into RNG Weirdness 2, where you have no idea what's gonna get flipped over from the top of the market deck, and it's entirely available as soon as it's flipped. So did you just kill something your opponent wanted? Well, it turns out it was the wrong play because the card after is even better for them. Sometimes it's the same as that card, which feels bad. This can feel worse because you're flipping from the same deck as your opponent. So sometimes buying a card for you is helping your opponent by giving them Princess Leia, oh shoot. But it's all hard to calculate for sure with 90 total galaxy cards, right? There's so many threads about whether or not the game is unbalanced. We suspect this comes from there just being blowout games due to people having great openings. And over a very long sample size and more knowledge, the balance evens out. However, we do have an inkling that the Empire is slightly stronger than the Rebels in the long run due to how they're capital ship centric, which are a very efficient card and give you health when playing them, and the Empire can buy the neutral ones to get all their amazing cheap TIE Fighter boosts. Turn one, I have five resources, uh, I buy capital ship and two TIE Fighters. Man, ruthless. This will keep the card draw snowballing. But hey, Rebels do have amazing hero cards, so not really gonna focus too much on faction balance for some such a light game. For the randomness cleanup, the game could prevent snowball-y high value cards from being bought early, and then everyone can see the next card or cards at the top of the deck before you flip them. While we're on this market discussion, let's talk about how it can get bricked and clogged up like teenager Anakin Skywalker. There could be neutral cards and neutral capital ships that maybe no one wants, so this market just doesn't really move. Technically, there are other ways to discard cards in the middle besides attacking them, like that, to keep the game moving, but if this happens, it can slow down the game game to pass an hour. And it can get worse if that happens and people start spamming healing ships. It's possible. There is a variant to purchase these to remove them, but then as we were saying before, once you remove something, you could be flipping something strong for your opponent. So it can be still a stalemate on whether or not you want to do anything with this 
central market. A quick fix to this could actually be both players getting a once per game clear of the center board. Or maybe they have to pay to clear or something. Just let there be a mass clear of some sort. The last gameplay con is the bases. There's some funkiness with some. For one, both factions have a base that lets you buy any card from the middle when you get it. Well, seeing how this is such a snowball-y short game, this card is an auto-lock second base if there's something 5 plus in the middle. Compare this to exiling 3 cards in your grave. Like, sure, that's thinning your deck, but cards are never straight up useless in this game. And it's so fast that you don't see many cycles of your deck for hard exiling to be worth it. This puts definitely a damper on replayability once you realize what bases are worth getting and which ones are not. But hey, I'm sure they made it like this to not make the game too long, and maybe there's a lot more base selection nuance in a 2v2 mode? Nitpicks, funny typo, ha 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 ha. Uh, for actual nitpicks, there's no way to denote whether or not something has attacked, which is kind of funky. Like you rotate stuff after using the ability, but you can still attack with them. So you kind of just put things to the side when attacking with them. Uh, they could have given you a token or told you to put things in a specific area after attacking, but again, not a huge deal. Recommender score, seven out of 10. Good. Mechanically, it's not doing anything too crazy in this deck builder realm besides killing the market for bounties. Randomness issues still don't prevent this from being visceral Star Wars fun. X-Wings going into combat, fighting on Endor, AT-ATs blasting for less damage on Hoth. Oh no, the rebel spies are sabotaging my hand again. Oh, uh, a snow speeder just blew up a Star Destroyer. Uh, whatever, this is meant to be a fairly casual game. Again, there's casualness with the new cards constantly coming out, which can be really exciting for those who always want to see new abilities, without being forced to read all 10 at once like in Dominion. But it can be frustrating for those who want consistent fairness. This reminds me of Radlands, which has a similar design approach. You and a buddy both play a toned down card dueler as you get cards from one shared deck. And these both have some mechanical sloppiness with the two players getting cards from one deck. But those issues can be negligible for those looking for the kitchen table accessibility as Star Wars Deck Builder is a filler-ish made for a wide crowd. There's many Star Wars moments in about 30 to 45 minutes, which is a huge win, especially if you are one with the Force and get it cheaper than MSRP. And there's an expansion on the horizon to be excited about. If you're not into Star Wars, well, there's not really anything too special here, but there's nothing that alarming either, but maybe you want to start with Dominion. If you're really into Star Wars but want something dense, well, there you go. Or you can just wait for the 2024 Star Wars CCG I got to play a proxied version of at our unofficial shelf con 2024. Woohoo. My personal score, 7 out of 10. Good. Me likey Star Wars. And deck building. And card game like games. Naturally, good time. It is kind of junk foodie since I played so many deck builders and CCGs. Like, it's brain dead ish. Buy the good cards, attack with strong cards, do that faction strategy, pick the right bases again. It doesn't have the biggest or most satisfying combos, but I sometimes have to do a cool think about how to manipulate the force or attacking something in the central row. In fact, I was surprised how nuanced the deck building feels because there's not really many duplicates of cards in the game. It's interesting to see if it's worth going for those low cost cards I normally wouldn't go for in these games, but their abilities can be situationally good. Also, investing in neutrals is pretty tricky. Job of the butt 2 OP though. So heck, even if this game is a little simple for me and the randomness of the market is kind of tilting, it's Star Wars and I feel like I'm here in 30 minutes. There's definitely zero downtime as I'm enjoying all the awesome art and remembering how cool these units and characters are. Yes, sir, let's use some more B-Wings. Now, if this wasn't Star Wars though, after my fifth playthrough, it'd probably be like a five out of 10 personal for me. But heck, it's Star Wars, so I can't wait for the expansion. Though maybe replayability still won't be great for me in the long run, but you know, it's kind of like a warm up for me or this. That was Star Wars, not Rebellion, Star Wars deck building. Uh, if you want it for a good price, maybe check out our Amazon link and see if you can grab it for the holidays. Pretty good like stocking stuffer or little holiday present game to play with the family. Anyways, thank you to our patrons for making videos like this possible. All you guys right here. And also thank you to our Mad Lads of Cardboard. Yeah, that's it for Star Wars deck building. Always fun to talk about Star Wars during the holiday season. Uh, yeah, uh, that's it.